Thanks, John. So I'm going to cover uh, emerging novel agents in myelofibrosis as part of this conference briefs program where the three of us are reviewing the myelofibrosis abstracts from ASCO, EHA, and SOHO of 2023. So this is a listing uh, of uh, many of the agents that are currently in development. There are certainly more, but as you can see, there's a, a whole slew of different uh, pathways being targeted as are shown uh, as are shown here. We have monoclonal antibodies, small molecules uh, against all of these different targets and uh, on the right, you can see their uh, phase of development currently. So clearly a very exciting time with many of these agents uh, having been touched on at these, at these three meetings. So we'll start with losparacept, which of course is not new and is a drug that we actually can use today, uh, albeit off-label for our patients with myelofibrosis and anemia, since this drug is available, as you know, for MDS and beta thalassemia. So uh, this was a phase two trial that was done uh, in myelofibrosis with four cohorts, as you see on the left up top. Uh, the patients could be uh, either on a stable dose of ruxolitinib or not on ruxolitinib, and they might also be transfusion dependent or transfusion independent. There was actually not room in this trial for transfusion requiring patients. You either had to be transfusion dependent by formal criteria or not uh, needing them at all. Now, so again, four cohorts, 95 patients total. And what this uh, particular abstract uh, at ASCO uh, uh, was, was focusing on was really the, the safety, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the results of uh, the efficacy from this trial has been presented a, a few times. And we know that the signal of greatest effic efficacy seems to be uh, in the patients on ruxolitinib, particularly those who uh, are requiring transfusions on ruxolitinib but also those who, who are not. Uh, but what you see here is the safety. So you see some hypertension with this agent. You see some diarrhea. There is some, uh, you know, uh, uh, limb pain, you know, bone muscle pain that can occur shortly after the, after the injection. But overall, a very well-tolerated uh, drug. Now, here is uh, the efficacy. I, I alluded to this a little bit. Here you see uh, the upper panel is for the primary treatment period, which would be uh, the 24 weeks, and then the entire treatment period uh, down below. Uh, as you see, again, four cohorts, and those are defined up there for you, uh, rocks or no rocks, transfusions or not. Uh, and as you see, again, cohort 3B is really what stands out, although cohort 3A uh, is also uh, 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 a little bit better than, uh, than say, cohort 1. So again, patients with RUCs or on RUCs requiring transfusions or not uh, seem to benefit more from Lusparacept. And this agent is now being developed in a phase 3 trial in patients on a stable dose of ruxolitinib who require transfusions. That is a placebo-controlled trial called independence. <clears throat> Now, moving on to naftimadlin, this is an interesting agent. It's an MDM2 inhibitor, small molecule. Uh, there were two studies actually presented in the same oral session at EHA. Uh, this first one was presented by Pankit Dachani from UAB. This shows uh, naftimadlin as a single agent, and we're looking here at survival, one of the more compelling um, aspects of this presentation. Again, this particular trial of single agent naptimadlin in JAK inhibitor relapsed or refractory myelofibrosis has been presented before, but what they were trying to do in this presentation is really focus on the longer term survival outcomes. So as you see here, very impressive, obviously, uh, uh, this particular graph is uh, uh, pertinent to the naftimadlin 240 milligrams uh, on days one through seven on a 28 day cycle. Uh, it, it's on that dose. There were other doses that were evaluated, other doses and schedules. Uh, but uh, even if you took all comers, the median survival was 35 months in this uh, in this uh, uh, jack inhibitor relapsed refractory population. But 
particularly on this slide, uh, what you see is that the median survival was not reached. And this is for the 240 milligram days one through seven Q28 days uh, uh, um, uh, subgroup of patients, which is really the go forward dose uh, for this for this drug. Now, now this um, development strategy for this uh, agent has actually been shelved subsequently, and it's no longer being developed as a single agent, which brings us to the very interesting abstract that John presented at the same oral session at EHA, uh, where naftamadlin was uh, added to uh, uh, to patients uh, having an insufficient response to to doxylithinib. So one of our add-on uh, strategy trials that we've become familiar with uh, in the field. This is a relatively small trial, as you see 24 patients shown here. Uh, you see the baseline characteristics on the left, on the right are the treatment emergent adverse events. Uh, so if you look at the baseline, baseline characteristics, uh, you know, this is a, a, a patient population with fairly large spleens, 2000 plus. Uh, the, the symptom burden is reasonable at 15. Uh, 10 is often a, often a threshold for these things. Uh, platelets are pretty good. So this is in general, um, not a cytopenic population where a drug like this would be hard to add, uh, but the results uh, were actually quite uh, uh, quite striking. Uh, this uh, showed 32 uh, percent for both spleen and symptoms. So again, when I say that, I'm of course referring to SVR35. Uh, and TSS fifty at twenty four weeks. Both of those were thirty two percent in this in this add on uh, study, uh, albeit small number of patients, but uh, pretty good actually among the best for what we see in the add on setting uh, for uh, for uh, you know partner drugs uh, of different mechanisms of action. Uh, John, comments uh, on this? Clearly, one of the more promising uh, strategies. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think the ability to combine this MDM2 inhibitor to RUX in order to restore that response was was quite was quite obvious here, both from a spleen and and symptom perspective. And th these are patients who you know, sort of maxed out their their benefit on on single agent RUX. So I, I was encouraged by this data, and I think I think the developmental pathway for this drug is best uh, in this setting where you're adding it and um, and improving upon a response that's inadequate on ruxolitinib. Absolutely, absolutely. Ruben, any comments? You know, I, I think that the add-on strategy is going to be, you know, the most attractive. You know, I mean, I clearly realize that there have been several that have gone to the, you know, the the upfront uh, approach to try to get the approval and, and see the strategy, but that's not how physicians think. I mean, for, for physicians have used, you know, single agent jack inhibition, you know, for the last 12 years, you know, and uh, I think, you know, likely doubling or more the expense of, of upfront therapy, I think we're going to probably see more maturation of data than we've had up to, up to this point from the, the phase three trials to really get a sense of, you know, who should have kind of combination therapy uh, from day one. But I think the addition uh, of therapy to suboptimal responders, I think will become much, much more uh, stringent you know, three months, you're not having a good enough response. Should we add something else in? So I think I think there's going to be a lot of competition in this, you know, what's good to add on space, you know. And this has a very interesting mechanism of action, you know, based on, uh, you know, a, a range of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so now moving on to Pilabrisib, uh, but in ET. So of course, a lot of the attention on this drug is in the context of MF, but there was actually a trial uh, presented by Francesco Passamonti on 20 patients uh, actually using this BET inhibitor from morphosis in ET. So uh, you see the results here, 20 patients, so small trial, early results, obviously the first results on Pilabrisib in ET. Now ET is a little bit of a difficult area to, to develop uh, a drug in, um, uh, for example, uh, it, it's not clear that uh, the platelet count uh, has much to do with thrombotic risk, for example, and that's one of the confounding factors uh, in, in this disease when you try to develop a, a drug or design a trial. But what you see here is that um, 
you're also getting a nice uh, reduction of the white count, which has been which has been correlated with uh, with thrombotic risk. Besides the platelet count, which you would expect a beta inhibitor uh, to reduce, uh, there was also some symptom benefit, and uh, you see that towards the bottom in the 14 uh, patients where this was evaluated. So more to come on this, uh, and look forward to future uh, iterations of, of these data. Now uh, there was also uh, data at uh, uh, at um, uh, these uh, summer uh, meetings uh, uh, on uh, manifest uh, the uh, the original trial of palabrasib in myelofibrosis. So this was presented from uh, Marina Kremianskaya, who works with uh, with John at Mount Sinai uh, on the add-on arm. And we were just talking about the add-on approach, how important that is uh, uh, in the context of naftamadlin. So palabrasib, uh, which of course was uh, has been in a phase three pivotal trial in the frontline setting, has also been looked at in the add-on setting. So what we are seeing here from manifest, this is, you know, 85 plus patients uh, is uh, the spleen volume change over time uh, in the manifest arm 2 which again is the add-on setting and what you see here is that the uh, spleen response rate gets a little bit better beyond 24 weeks uh, at which point it is 17 percent but after that you see at week 28 it is uh, at week 48 sorry it is 21 percent uh, so this speaks to some of the durability there uh, now, Claire Harrison had presented arm three of uh, of Manifest. Again, the Manifest was the open label trial of palabrasib with three arms. There was a monotherapy arm, arm one. There was an add on arm, arm two, which we just talked about, and there was a, uh, a, a frontline combination arm that is arm three, which then informed the the Manifest two trial, uh, which was the large big phase three uh, placebo control. So, what you see here is uh, again uh, screen volume change over time in manifest arm three now here uh, of course uh, you know uh, the 68 percent uh, um, uh, screen response rate at 24 weeks has been much talked about it's uh, clearly a much higher number than one would typically expect with Rux alone uh, and, and what you see here is what happens to that over time at 48 weeks and, and 60 weeks so it, it drops off a little bit clearly but uh, but I think uh, what you see here is that you're still maintaining with still maintaining SVR35 rates that are higher than what one sees with Rux alone. Now, this is about Selinexor. This is an interesting drug, uh, familiar to our viewers from its approval in myeloma and, and some types of lymphoma. This is a uh, um, what is called a selective inhibitor of nuclear export. Uh, and so this drug uh, actually has been studied both as a single agent, not shown here, and with ruxolitinib uh, in uh, uh, in this trial called Export MF034, which is now entering the phase three portion. It's the same trial. What we are showing you here is uh, data from the phase one portion. So 24 patients, 14 of whom received Selinexor 60 milligrams once a week, and the other 10 received uh, 40 milligrams once a week. And again, these data have been presented a few times, I believe at prior ASCO and ASH meetings. But what was shown at this uh, recent ASCO uh, meeting, uh, as well as at SOHO, was really looking at different, um, uh, uh, looking at the data by, uh, you know, different types of uh, stratification. And what they really were, were able to show that uh, even in patients with really low doses of RUX, which we uh, do not really consider uh, a, a very effective, uh, for example, 5-BID, you still saw uh, Selenexor making a very important contribution there and really this uh, maintenance of the of the uh, spleen and symptom response rates, despite that very uh, low uh, dose of RUX, and similarly for gender, similarly for uh, uh, for for different um, categories of spleen volume, these responses were were maintained. Now I should mentioned just to put things in perspective that with the caveat that this is a very small number of patients 14 receiving 60 milligrams 10 receiving uh, the 40 milligrams 
these are the highest response rates we've really seen in the field in in uh, these these combination uh, uh, combination approaches so this is just again a breakdown of those responses by these different uh, different categories now ruben let me ask you this uh, you know since you led uh, uh, some of the you know the comfort trials for example and other jack inhibitor trials what is your take on this female male um, um, distribution of responses? Well, we typically have not seen differences by gender, you know, so, so again, don't know whether, whether this is just happenstance in terms of this particular study. You know, so, so overall, our phase three studies, of which we now have a fair number, we really not see gender play, play a, a big role. So, so not sure yet, although, you know, Selenaxor has a very interesting mechanism of action. So, you know, perhaps there's something more specific to the mechanism of action of the drug. Sure. Um, and also, I guess the main point perhaps is more, the bigger takeaway might be this low dose of rocks, which Selenexor seems to be able to complement. John, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. We, you know, we saw the same phenomena with naphtamadolin. You could, you could actually get the synergy at low doses of rocks with with the combination partner um, while while minimizing toxicity. I mean, I think what's interesting here is you're, you know, we're looking at, you know, 40 and 60 milligrams. This is once weekly. So this is not the doses that's used in B cell malignancies. And and as you point out, even though it's a you know few number of patients, um, you know, the, the responses are, are quite dramatic and even in the setting of low dose rock. So I'm anxious to see how this plays out in the greater phase three study. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, and then this is a, a small study that we're doing at MD Anderson. This is an investigator sponsored uh, uh, using a drug called elotuzumab, again familiar to our audience from its use in myeloma. So this is the anti-SLAM F7 monoclonal antibody. There is data preclinically uh, suggesting that monocytes are the precursors of fibrocytes and therefore are ultimately responsible for the bone marrow fibrosis in this disease. And SLAM F7 is a target uh, that that one that one can utilize uh, to to uh, to try and deplete that population of monocytes that gives rise to the fibrocytes and ultimately the fibrosis. So this is a small study, 15 patients. Uh, 12 uh, are, are um, uh, uh, I presented on 12 at the at the EHA meeting. You're seeing some of the baseline characteristics here. I'll just briefly mention that we've seen some responses uh, in in different parameters actually. So so symptom responses. We've seen uh, certainly anemia responses, and we've also seen platelet responses. Uh, so it, it's it's interesting uh, and perhaps. Uh, like many other things, uh, deserves ultimately a place in a combination approach, but we're not there yet. And this is a this is a monotherapy trial, single center, like I like I just said. Uh, Mylox one was a trial of a drug called GB two zero six four, and the target is uh, lysyl oxidase like two, which is uh, an extracellular matrix enzyme. So uh, blocking it again could be an anti-fibrotic strategy. Very preliminary results at this point here, uh, presented by Claire Harrison and Iha. But what you're seeing on this slide is five individual patients and what happens to their bone marrow fibrosis at different time points. So reticulin collagen as shown. So again, very early results. We will see what happens with this. But again, another novel anti-fibrotic uh, strategy. Um, <clears throat> now, Ropig, which is, of course, on the market for the last two years in the US for polycythemia vera, uh, is being looked at in early myelofibrosis. So uh, this is a, a, a very practically designed trial where they enrolled both prefibrotic primary myelofibrosis, which as you know, is a pathologic entity, and also patients who could be uh, deemed to have early, clinically early uh, myelofibrosis, even if it's pathologically overt or, or post-PV or post-ET. So those uh, patients all received ROPEG. This is a trial that I think is very helpful as we sometimes use this drug off-label uh, for our patients with early myelofibrosis. 62 uh, patients here. So as you can see, it was clearly uh, clearly active. Uh, you know, you see responses at 24 weeks in the hemoglobin, white cells, and platelets in the 70-80% range. Um, now, 
these are mostly patients who were started early on after diagnosis, five months, median time from diagnosis to treatment. Uh, baseline characteristics are shown towards the bottom left, uh, or actually all uh, along uh, the left. Uh, and then you see some JAK2 allele burden reductions, obviously always of interest with an interferon uh, product. Uh, BMS 986158 is a BET inhibitor. Again, palabrasive has generated enormous enthusiasm for this mechanism, and there are uh, multiple companies studying their BET inhibitors. This is one of them. Uh, this was presented uh, by uh, Haifa uh, Al Ali uh, at, at EHA. Uh, and you see here interesting design where the drug could be combined with rocks in frontline patients and with fedrathenib in second line patients in the same trial. So again, you see the SVR rates at, uh, this is SVR 35. So these are bona fide responses. SVR 35 at 12 weeks, SVR 35 at 24 weeks. And you, you see some, some pretty high uh, responses here uh, uh, with this, with this uh, BET inhibitor in combination with JAK. What was uh, absent from this presentation, however, was any uh, results on symptoms. And uh, we shall see, hopefully we'll get that at a, uh, at a future uh, presentation. But clearly, spleen response is looking very good. Uh, and this is another very novel and interesting compound, TP3654. So this is a PIM1 kinase inhibitor. There have been other PIM kinase inhibitors, but this is a very intriguing one thus far with early results uh, from at both ASH last year and then EHA, as I'm showing you now, as well as at ASH uh, 2023. Uh, so what, what, what we see here in this monotherapy trial in patients who've previously received JAK inhibitor uh, or, or, or are not candidates for JAK inhibitors, the majority having received prior JAK inhibitors, uh, what we're seeing here is a clear symptom signal. There is some SVR35, but clearly the TSS50 is more impressive. And again, there, is, there seems to be a correlation albeit early small numbers of patients with cytokine reductions. So uh, very uh, interested to see what happens uh, there going forward uh, as, as we are able to correlate these cytokine benefits uh, with, with, this, with the symptom improvement. Uh, John and Ruben, thoughts on this? This is very uh, uh, unique and novel. Yeah, I, I, I was also interested in this, in this abstract and the development of this drug. I mean, the, what, what's probably most... Um, eye-catching is these symptom improvements. Symptom improvements are, are quite deep uh, with uh, this PIM1 kinase inhibitor. And the PIM1 or PIM kinase inhibitors have been evaluated previously in this field and have really been plagued by by uh, myelosuppression, particularly they've been used in combination. And here, you know, we're seeing an agent that has clinical activity um, and um, less, you know, less myelosuppression than you would expect, which really to me makes it a really ideal uh, combination partner. Um, so I, I look forward to see how this drug develops, you know, in the future as a combination with a JAK inhibitor. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. I think first the mechanism of action, I think has always lent itself to combination approaches, you know, and two, you know, as we saw from the, you know, the combination phase three trials and other things, you know, deepening the symptom response, you know, has not necessarily been something we've seen with the new agents, you know, so I think this almost kind of screams out you know, further combinations with other things. Uh, but I think it'd be really helpful to, to, to have in the mix. And it seems to be fairly fairly benign as well. And, and that's always a key thing as well. You, you know, what is the benefit you get versus, you know, the toxicity? So the less toxic, the, the more benefit, the easier really a, a clinical case. Absolutely. Yes, indeed, symptoms have been hard to improve over RUPS alone. And the tolerability piece, very important, absolutely. Um, and here uh, is uh, um, uh, Zilurgi Sertib. I think uh, Ruben had alluded to this uh, briefly. These are uh, this is an ALK2 or ACVR1 inhibitor, uh, which is being studied both alone and in combination with ruxolitinib. Uh, that's that's what the two treatment groups represent. TGA is monotherapy. TGB is uh, in addition to a stable dose of ruxolitinib. Uh, this is data that I presented at uh, ASCO and EHA. Uh, essentially, there were patients who were uh, transfusion dependent as well as those who were not, but were 
were, were clearly anemic. And what we've already started to see in this study is responses in the anemic patients, not yet in the transfusion dependent patients, but absolutely in the uh, non-transfusion dependent anemic patients to this ACVR1 L2 inhibitor, both alone and in combination with, with ruxolitinib. Uh, it is also a well-tolerated drug. The, the 600 milligrams uh, is now being evaluated. These results, however, are on the lower doses, 200, 400. Uh, there's nice reduction of hepcidin as well, which is the mechanism of action. So that is a proof of principle. It's reducing hepcidin in a dose-dependent manner, and it is a well-tolerated drug. Some alopecia at high doses, but that's really at the 600. Um, and this is uh, uh, also a BET inhibitor. As I said, multiple companies are studying their BET inhibitors. Uh, this is called INCB057643. Uh, uh, and this uh, is also a study with multiple cohorts. Uh, uh, it was studied alone um, as well as in combination with ruxolitinib. So dose escalation is ongoing. What you see on this table uh, um, are the monotherapy doses 4, 8, 10, 12. Now this part has been uh, completed actually and uh, 10 and 6 are the go forward doses for the monotherapy based on the patient's uh, baseline platelet count uh, with, with the 12 milligram running into some DLTs. Uh, for the combination, uh, uh, as you see here, that, that's a bit behind in the development. That is uh, uh, the four milligrams combination has been, has been cleared and uh, further escalation is ongoing. So again, uh, an interesting drug, clearly a proven mechanism of action at this point uh, and we'll see uh, what is next with, with, with this drug. But, but the monotherapy dose escalation is complete. And that will be all. Again, that was uh, that was not all the drugs being uh, developed, uh, but but quite a few of them. And hopefully, that was a good, uh, quick though overview. Uh, thank you all for for joining us. Thank you, John and Ruben, uh, for your very insightful discussions earlier on in the program. Uh, and thank you to our viewers for listening.